cooperation meeting. The takeaways from the meeting, which include public comments by President Obama, apparently are a vow to fight protectionism among member nations and a strengthening of China's role in trade. But one of the largest topics of discussion at the APEC meeting was about Donald Trump, who wasn't even there. So what does the outcome of the APEC meeting mean for the president-elect who campaigned on the promise to renegotiate existing trade agreements and sign future trade deals in ways that clearly favor America? We'll talk about this with James Glassman, an insider in the administration of President George W. Bush. He's a frequent commentator on business and investments. He served as Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs under President George W. Bush. All right, what, what do you make of that meeting, the whole question of what we're going to do about that trade agreement currently uh, being fought over that the president is in favor of and Trump and Hillary were both against? Where, right. does, where does our friend Mr. Glassman stand? Well, I'm a big fan of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or TPP, that involves a lot of uh, Asian partners as well as uh, South American partners. And, uh, but it, it's dead. It, it's over. There's no doubt about that. I think it would have been quite beneficial, and, it, and I hope that it comes back. But certainly, uh, President-elect Trump has, has made it very clear during his campaign that he was not going to support it. So that's pretty much out. And that's a problem, not just from a trade point of view, but also one of the reasons that we wanted to do that was that it was helpful in our kind of strategic relationship with Asian countries vis-a-vis -vis China. It puts us in a stronger position against China. Now China is strengthened, and China will be, as it is now, the, the number one uh, trade partner for much of Asia. So I think that's not good for us. And perhaps over the next year or two, it will become evident to, uh, to President Trump as well as to the Congress. But at this point, it's not good. And, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing, we're, we're going to be considering, certainly, uh, President Trump uh, renegotiating, he said, uh, trade deals that we already have established, such as NAFTA. And how do you feel about that? Well, I think that would also be a mistake. Well, well let me put it this way. NAFTA has been around for 22 years. NAFTA is a trade agreement among the United States, Canada, and Mexico. I think it's been a tremendous success. We do $1 trillion worth of trade among us. And, but it's 22 years old. So I think the idea of having new discussions about ways to improve NAFTA is a very good idea. Maybe even renaming NAFTA is a good idea. But the notion that we would be raising trade barriers between the United States and Mexico or the United States and Canada, that is not a good idea. Uh, we really depend on trade in both directions with Mexico. There are lots of American companies, Caterpillar, uh, automobile companies, that really depend on having uh, no, no tariff barriers between the United States and Mexico. I mean, the United States does $250 billion dollars worth of exports to Mexico a year. Uh, they're an enormous partner in agricultural products and, and machinery is, a, is our number one export to Mexico. So if you threaten that, then you threaten American jobs. So I don't think it's a great idea, but certainly discussions about how to improve NAFTA, okay, that's fine. You supported Hillary. You recently wrote an opinion piece claiming you're optimistic about Mr. Trump. Why? Well, I think what I'm optimistic about is America in general. So you're right. I supported, uh, I supported Hillary Clinton. I think that Trump will bring a, a fresh start to government. We're not going to be stuck in the, old, in the old patterns that we've been in. But it really depends on who he puts in important positions and exactly what his policies are going to be. I think you know as well as I do, Larry, that during the campaign, he was all over the lot. So it's very hard to say what his foreign policy is going to be, for example. Now, we just talked about trade. I think it's pretty clear where he stands on trade. He's very skeptical of trade deals, and there I disagree with him, but we know where he stands there. 
but how he, where he stands specifically on the Middle East or on our relationships with Russia or our relationship with China, tremendously important, it's, it's hard to say. And so we'll see how that uh, unfolds. Is General Flynn an indication of where it will go? Could be, but I think that one of the things about General Flynn, and he certainly is a controversial character, uh, is that General Flynn was really one of the few fairly high-level national security people who, was, uh, who backed Trump right from the start. And I think there was a personal connection there. So, yes, uh, General Flynn has a very important job. I think it's a very difficult job being the, uh, the head of... Uh, the head of, essentially, the head of national security within the White House. It's a tough job because he has to balance the, the interests and the personalities of people like the defense secretary and the, and the uh, secretary of state, whoever they're going to be, and the intelligence people. It's, it's a tough job. I think Condoleezza Rice, who was in that job uh, as national security advisor and then later became secretary of state, she would tell you what I'm telling you. It's tough to, to balance those interests. So we'll see how well he does at that. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure that he is a signal for where the administration is going. I think more important will be the person that he chooses as Secretary of State and the person he chooses as Secretary of Defense. Do you know about Jan General James Mattis, who's been widely rumored to be Secretary of Defense? I, I, I do. I like practically every person who's ever met General Mattis, as I have, um, I really like him. There's, uh, he has a magnetism. He has a forthrightness. He is, uh, he is a great guy. And I think that um, I think he, he would be a very good addition to a Trump administration. Now, some people will have some skepticism about his ability to manage a large institution like the Defense Department, which is the, the single largest organization that we have in the United States, um, I think he'll be good. But it's really hard to say because a lot of generals are not necessarily well suited to running large organizations like that. Uh, a little bit different from being somebody who gives orders. But I think he'll be good if, he, if, if that is the position that Donald Trump wants him in. Um, Actually, he, he, he might have made a better national security advisor. But at any rate, I would love to see him in the administration. Yes, General Mattis. Who would James Glassman like to see as at state? Um, well, <laughs> who I'd like to see is I'd like to see Condoleezza Rice back again, but I don't think that's going to happen. So among the people that have been discussed, I think, uh, I think Governor Romney would be good. I'm a little nervous about some of the talk about people who clearly have no foreign policy experience, like uh, Rudy Giuliani or even Nikki Haley, whom I like, but I'm not sure you know, how she'd fare in a position like that. It's a very difficult job, let me tell you. Uh, you know, R Governor Romney doesn't have a tremendous amount of foreign policy experience either, of course, but I think he has shown that he has the kind of diplomatic temperament. I like his, his positions on things. So I think he'd be good. And it would be a good signal, by the way, Larry, to send that uh, here's somebody who, who opposed him during the election and Donald Trump um, thinks enough of him or wants uh, reconciliation to that extent that he would appoint him to that position. As Lincoln did with his cabinet. Exactly. Yeah. Good point. Yes, exactly. Uh, James, are you a little concerned about what he's going to do about his private industries and being president. Having his children run them is hardly putting it in a blind trust. Some are saying he should just sell them all off. I think that, that uh, President Trump will put himself in a very vulnerable position if he keeps his properties. I think it's a mistake from his point of view. Um, you know, the, 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 there is no such thing as, a, as conflict of interest rules for a president, but there is such a thing in the Constitution as the Emoluments Clause, which essentially says that if you're the president, uh, you can't do things that will per that will uh, be personally beneficial to you from a financial point of view. And I think that people will be continually second guessing him because he has uh, properties in so many different countries that if he favors one country, 
that people are going to say, well, that's because he has a hotel there. And so even if he is completely innocent, as I'm, I'm sure he will be, of doing that kind of thing, he opens himself up to criticism for, in my opinion, no good reason. Right. So, he's yes, 70 I would years like to see him take some steps. You know, he's 70 years old. He's a billionaire. He's president of the United States. What other goals could he have? Why not sell off everything off and live your life out as the president of the United States? Completely agree with you. Completely agree. I think it's better not only for him personally, but I think it's better for the country if he does that. Have you talked to President George W. Bush about all of this? No, I have not. I haven't. I, I, the last time I talked to him was almost it was about a year ago. And we just talked, chatted in general terms. At that point, uh, the, the uh, election contest was, was still very much up in the air, that's for sure. How do but you? No, I haven't. As well as you know him, how do you think he feels about all this? He must feel terrible about the way his brother was handled. Um, I just, all I can do is guess, and so I would make the same guess that, that, that you make about, about his, his brother. But, you know, here's the thing about President Bush. He is, he's a real patriot. So what he cares about is that America succeeds. And, you know, I, I think he will give Donald Trump any help Donald Trump asks for, quite frankly. And I, I, I would urge uh, Donald Trump to get on the phone, if he hasn't already, and maybe he has and I missed it, uh, to talk to, to President Bush, as, as I'm sure uh, other presidents have done, who's, who, or there was only one other president who succeeded him. But I, I, I think that that's a good idea, and I, I think President Bush would be uh, amenable to helping in any way. So, uh, you know, however he might feel. President Obama also said that he would not be, he will, he'll, he'll think about criticizing him. George W. Bush never criticized Obama. He would think about criticizing Trump, but on a, a major moral issue, he would. How do you feel about former presidents and current presidents? I'll tell you, I, I think President Bush, George W. Bush, has been absolutely uh, right on in his attitude toward uh, President Obama, which was, I'll help you. I will not criticize you in public. And wh why did he say that? He said it because he knows better than anyone, how tough a job it is to be president of the United States. I, I like President Bush's position uh, that, that I'm not going to speak. I'm not going to speak. I'm not going to get directly involved, certainly, in presidential politics. I'm going to devote myself to, to doing other kinds of good works. I've served my term. That's it. I, I like that attitude. Jim, always great seeing you. Wonderful great talking with you. Great seeing you, Larry. Thanks, Thanks for your time as well. I hope you come Thanks. back soon, because I love talking to you. Uh, I love talking to you. Thanks. We'll be back with more politicking right after the break. Politicking. Steve Bannon has been a lightning rod in Donald Trump's campaign, and now in the team the president-elect is building for his administration. Some political leaders are calling on Mr. Trump to fire Bannon, and many human rights and civil rights groups have vowed to fight Bannon's White House job tooth and nail. But do we have a complete picture of it? And what's his hold on the president-elect? Let's talk about that with Joe Pollack. Someone who knows Steve Bannon and someone who works at Bannon's former news site, Breitbart News. Joel is senior editor at large at Breitbart. He's also the author of the latest book out called See No Evil 19 Hard Truths the Left Can't Handle. Okay. 
What don't we know about? Tell me about him, this man of mystery. <laughs> Well, first of all, he's very accomplished in the business world. He's a Harvard graduate, naval officer, highly accomplished. And he was on the board of Breitbart prior to 2012. Andrew Breitbart passed away March 1st of 2012, and then Steve began to take a more active role. And I've worked with Steve every day for the last five years. And he's a great manager, tough manager, very disciplined, very opinionated. We argue all the time, but he has a basic rule, which is bring data to the table, bring facts to the table, and I'll change my mind if you're right and that's how Steve runs his operation he's a guy who looks for talent in places you might not normally seek it he has an open mind and has a vision and I think that's why the Trump campaign turned around from the time he came in as CEO in August until November 8th Kellyanne Conway and the other people he brought in were also very effective but Steve is the kind of person you want in a situation when people need to do their jobs, they need to focus, and they need to unite around a common vision. I can think of many examples at Breitbart where we went through a rough patch for whatever reason, and he's calm under pressure. He basically pulled everybody together. And I think he's a very good person to have in the White House because we tend to think about everything in terms of what's good for Democrats or Republicans, but we also have to think about what's good for the country. And you need someone giving advice to Donald Trump who has been in military situations before, who's been in tough business situations before, and who keeps calm under pressure. What do you and he argue about? I think one of the most open arguments we have is about Paul Ryan. I'm, I'm a Paul Ryan fan. And, and he I, is not. He, he is, let's just say he's more skeptical. <laughs> so we have, we have argued back and forth about some of the budget issues that come up. There's some of the editorial discussions that go on behind the scenes. And often there will be point counterpoint on the website. The Eagle Forum came out about a week ago with a piece saying that Ryan shouldn't be speaker and I came out with a counterpoint to that. This is past the time when Steve was working it, but just to give you an idea, I came out with a piece saying Ryan's got some great fiscal legislation. He could just bring it to the White House. Trump could sign it and the country's fiscal situation would turn around. So I, I'm very confident in, in what, Brian, what Ryan brings to the table, but there are other views at Breitbart and, and a wide variety of views is what we, what we try to Explain bring. Explain this, though. Your former co-worker, Ben Shapiro, who he was with us, he resigned in protest. He, saying, he said Bannon is a vindictive, nasty figure, infamous for verbally abusing supposed friends and threatening enemies. How do you make of that? You have to report everything Ben says with a caveat that Ben runs a competing website. And at the time he left Breitbart, right, 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 he also went to run a competing website. So I think you have to take that with a very healthy, healthy dose, dose of salt. Uh, I don't agree with Ben. I think that Ben has opinions to which he's entitled. But uh, one interesting thing about Ben is he has not piled on on the other criticisms of Steve. He has said Steve's not an anti-Semite. He has never seen any sort of anti-Semitic language. So I think that that's the whole basis of this discussion is that Bannon was accused of being discriminatory and all that stuff, and it's all false. And even Ben, who had what he describes now as an acrimonious relationship, although, again, take it with a grain of salt, doesn't say those things. And I think that that should tell you the fact that there's no basis to those charges whatsoever. You, are you an Orthodox Jew? I am. And... Uh... Do you? Re what about the remarks that his wife made in a divorce suit that um, he didn't want his children to go to a school where they took Jews? I don't know why we would take that seriously. It, it's why not, not? Well, we don't. First of all, he doesn't agree that he said that. He denies that he said that. Secondly, uh, you know, divorce <laughs> lawsuits. I, you know, without going into personal histories, people say things in, in divorce uh, filings all the time. I mean, we're watching. Brangelina go at each other uh, and say horrible things. Brad Pitt being accused of child abuse, investigated, nothing to those charges. But, you know, you see these things happen in divorces. Divorces can be very ugly, unfortunately. So how do... And, it, and, I, don't, and I, I don't credit how that. How did all the anti-Semitism things start from that? I think that that came out, I think it was the New York Daily News back in August. And all of the things being said now were exactly the same things that are said in August. There's no new information. It's basically just recycling stories from the campaign. Why it's, doesn't... You know him well, right? I know him very well, yeah. Why doesn't he come out and do a major interview? I mean, uh, sit down wherever, here, wherever, and talk about this. He did an interview with Kim Strassel of the Wall Street Journal, and he also did one with Michael Wolf of The Hollywood Reporter, I think, before that. 
and and he just dismisses this stuff. I mean, part of the problem is when people play into this game, prove to me you've stopped beating your wife, you know, prove to me you're not a pedophile or whatever, you give credence to a charge that is ridiculous. And he's basically dismissed it. Uh, he told Kim Strassel uh, exactly how he felt on the weekend, and he's and focused how does on the. He, he feels that it's nonsense. And look, the most offensive thing that Steve Bannon ever did was help Donald Trump win the White House. And he understands this is the price you pay. Andrew Breitbart, the founder of the company, said in his memoir, Righteous Indignation, that this is what the left will do to you if you are successful. They'll turn anybody into the KKK. And lo and behold, five years after that book comes out, it's happening to Steve Bannon. It happens to everybody. The big cardinal sin that Steve Bannon committed was being successful. Nobody heard of him, and those who had heard of him were complimentary, thought great things about him, said good things about him, until he became prominent, until he became successful. Now, all of a sudden, there's, you know, people you talk about human rights and civil rights. I mean, one of the most important civil rights and human rights is the presumption of innocence. And to me, to slander somebody, to repeat lies upon lies upon lies that are unsubstantiated. I mean, where's the anti-Semitism? Show me one example where he's said anything anti-Semitic. They can't. The ADL, Anti-Defamation League, had to come out and say, we're actually not aware of anything he's ever said that's anti-Semitic. So they had to walk it back. But yet these groups are petitioning. What they're revealing is that they don't really care about rights. They just care about politics because they're willing to perpetuate a lie for their political purposes. Donald Trump's son-in-law is an Orthodox Jew. His wife, his, his wife, Donald's daughter, converted. Mm -hmm. Do you, who'll be the bigger voice in the White House, Bannon or him? Because well, he's going to be prominent. Well, you know who, who makes, the boss is never, is never the husband, the boss is always the wife. So, if, yeah, it's interesting you asked me about Bannon or him, it's probably Ivanka. No, I, I don't know. Um, I, I think that the biggest voice will be Donald Trump. He's got two leading figures in the White House, Steve Bannon and Reince Priebus. They both come from different walks of life. Reince from the Republican National Committee, Steve from outside. And I think that's an interesting balance because Reince is really an inside guy. He is a Beltway guy. He's a party man. Steve, on the other hand, is from outside the Beltway. He's from the grassroots, from Breitbart. And I think, in a way, that's a good balance. You need to have someone who can communicate with the party establishment and coordinate with Congress. And on the other hand, you need someone who reminds Trump all the time of the promises he made to those voters in Michigan, of the promises he made to voters everywhere of the, of the commitment to drain the swamp. And, and Steve is that kind of person. So I think that there's going to be a healthy tension between the White House and Congress, between Steve and Reince. And I think Jared Kushner, from what I know of him, I don't know him personally. I have met his brother. I do know his brother's a very nice guy, although he, I think his brother's for Clinton, not for Trump. Um, but I, I think they're a nice family. I, th I think it'll be a healthy balance, a team of rivals. But ultimately, it'll come down to Donald Trump himself. Uh, but you like and respect Mr. Kushner. You don't know him. I know his younger son. His younger son uh, was a classmate of my wife's in college, actually. So and he, was a, he was a very nice guy. We've lost touch, but he was a good guy. All right. Guy. Let's go over yeah. some of the appointments. What do you make of Jeff Sessions, attorney general? I like him a lot, and I've had the chance to get to know him a little bit. We, we met a couple of times on the campaign trail. He is the intellectual heart, in a way, of the Donald Trump policy shop. And I think he'll be an outstanding attorney general. I think he's very no-nonsense. I think he's very qualified for the job, if you look at his history. He's also very tough on immigration. That's his number one issue. And so I think that the selection of Sessions is a message, basically, to the sanctuary cities, to San Francisco especially, and to others, that there's going to have to be a change, that we're not going to let federal law slide. So how it will be interesting will, to watch. How tough will he be against civil rights abusers? I think he'll be very tough. And you do? Yeah. Based on what? Based on conversations I've had with him about it before the appointment, long before uh, he and I spoke about some of these issues in a completely different context, but I know that he cares deeply about civil rights. So I, I feel like he'll he be... He does yeah. because in his record, he was turned down for a federal judgeship because of statements he's made. Right, well, you know, that's... He voted against all the voting rights bills. He... Well, that, that's a different story because the, some of these voting rights bills were struck down by the Supreme Court. We know that portions of the Voting Rights Act were, were struck down. I think that there's another problem we have in our Justice Department, which is that the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department has gone completely off the rails. So I think he'll rein them in. You've got people being sued for civil rights violations that don't really seem like ordinary civil rights violations. I can, I can name examples if you'd like, but I think that has to be reined in as well. Um, but I do know that he has a commitment to civil rights, just because I've spoken to him about it. I, I, you know, some of the conversations were off the record, and I haven't been able to um, divulge some of them. But certainly in other contexts, he's taken these issues very seriously, the same issues that 
concern you and I, that concern everybody, issues of racism, issues of uh, extremists, real extremists. I'm not talking about the ones they make up and, and blame for, for false extremism, but, you know, the Ku Klux Klan and things like that. Does, I think he takes that very seriously. Is anything about Donald Trump, the tweeting, the, the, <laughs> Donald, the Donald, does anything concern you? Sure, sure. I think that every citizen ought to be concerned. And when you elect someone with a, a mandate for change, what have we seen in the last few elections? We've seen Republicans elected first in that Tea Party sweep in 2010, and then in the Senate takeover in 2014. And each time they came in and said, we're going to change things, we're going to repeal this, we're going to repeal that, and they never did. So, of course I'm concerned. I think we have to be concerned that he's going to do what he says he's going to do, and I think we have to hold him accountable. As to other things, I mean, I, I, I don't think that some of what's out there... Uh, people talking about, you know, the end of the world, basically, because Donald Trump became president. I mean, I think that's overblown, and I think it's a result of the rhetoric of the campaign lingering over. And I think people should use Thanksgiving as a chance to step back, spend time with family, play some football, and, and come back and realize that we have a great constitution, a system of checks and balances. If we don't like what Donald Trump's doing, we have lots of ways to oppose it. We have lots of ways to hold him in check and to steer him back in the right direction if he does the wrong thing. But I, I, I think that we can never rest easy. There's always... Uh, the, the chance that people in power will do the wrong thing. And so I think that it's up to journalists and citizens and, and civil society to hold them accountable no matter who's in office. Thank you. Thank you. Always good seeing you. You too. Thanks to Joel Pollack for joining me on this edition of Politicking. And remember, you can join the conversation on my Facebook page. Check out the Politicking blog on our homepage or tweet me at King's Things. And don't forget, use the Politicking hashtag. Have a happy Thanksgiving. And that's all for this edition of Politicking.